when we released our RGB 200 series episode on the Nintendo GameCube in early 2016, HDMI and other video output alternatives were just barely starting to become a reality for the console. Since then, the GameCube landscape has changed a fair bit and we now have a variety of products that have the potential to beat Nintendo's official component cables in both price and functionality. So let's take a look at a handful of the newest options for getting the most out of your GameCube. As was standard for the time, the Nintendo GameCube shipped with a set of standard yellow, red, and white RCA cables, composite video, and stereo sound, a basic but commonly available connection. The system's analog AV out port is capable of S-Video and NTSC regions and RGB and PAL regions. However, this port only supports video in the 15 kHz range. For NTSC regions, that's mostly just 480i. If you want to ditch interlaced video for progressive output, then you're going to need another solution. As luck would have it, the GameCube launched with a digital AV port on the rear of the console. This was originally envisioned to allow for hardware such as some sort of 3D glasses or headset. Alas, the full potential of this port was never realized during its day. Instead, Nintendo released a set of component cables along with the equivalent D-Terminal version in Japan, which uses special hardware hidden inside the connector to convert the port's digital video to analog YPB PR, more commonly referred to as component video. Component video wasn't yet a widely adopted format. Due to these cables being sold only through Nintendo and the digital output being removed from later GameCube systems, the component cables are relatively rare and have since become a highly desired and valuable commodity. Since no other device ever used the GameCube's custom digital output, producing a suitably molded third-party connector would be a considerable investment. But more crucially, someone had to be the first to make sense of the GameCube's digital signals. This work was done a few years back by someone going by the name of Unseen. This was the beginning of the open source GC video project, opening the way for anyone to create and sell their own GameCube digital out mods, alternatives to the official component cables, and HDMI adapters. Today, a number of options exist, and we've got our hands on a few of the best designed third-party options for enhancing your GameCube experience. While none of these are exactly inexpensive, they do support useful functionality over the official component cables and are also vastly more affordable. In this episode, we'll be looking at the GCHD and the GCHD Mark II by Eon Gaming, the Carby by Insurrection Industries, and the GC Duel by Dan Coons, along with how they compare to regular GameCube and Wii output through upscalers like the Open Source Scan Converter and the Framemeister. The GCHD and Carby products were provided to us for review, while the GC Duel was a purchase kit installed by Jason of GameTech US. For European customers, GC Duel is available for installation through Video Game Perfection, where their open source scan converter is also sold. It's important to know that all of these products are built on the same open source code base originally produced by Unseen, and for the most part have virtually the same features and picture quality. However, GC video devices may have firmware tweaks implemented by the manufacturer, and we'll point out the differences when we can. First, a quick overview of each. The $150 GC HD by Eon Gaming was not the first mod-free plug-and-play HDMI device for the GameCube, but it was the first to be generally praised by the retro tech community for its safe and secure design. Not to mention, it was widely available through online retailers such as Amazon as a mass-produced product. The GCHD features a two-pronged design to occupy both the analog and digital ports for maximum stability. However, it is a rather tight fit that requires extra pressure to click into place, and we wouldn't want to plug it in and out too many times. But we do like the side placement of the HDMI output, which helps minimize stress on the ports. This GCHD design is now discontinued in favor of the Mark II model, which we'll get to in just a moment. The Carby by Insurrection Industries is an attractive smaller HDMI plug-and-play that features an astounding reproduction of the official Nintendo Digital Connector plug. It looks so good and clicks in just right. The Carby has an attractive price too, costing only $75. While this unit is clear plastic and runs on firmware 2.4a, Insurrection is currently transitioning over to selling units with 2.4b, along with some additional shell options. Anyone interested in updating the firmware may do so via the internal JTAG connector, or by sending the unit to Insurrection for service. 
Since the Carby only occupies the digital output, it's possible to simultaneously use HDMI alongside S-Video on NTSC consoles, or RGB on PAL consoles, as long as the progressive scan mode is not engaged. While this does limit you to interlaced output, it could be useful if, say, you wanted to play on a CRT while sending a digital signal to an HDMI capture card for a stream. Instruction also let us borrow their component cable development prototype. While this product is hopefully not too far off, production prototypes with molded strain relief were not ready in time for this video. Instruction's plan is to use 75 ohm coaxial cable with BNC connectors for those with professional equipment. But these can be easily and cheaply adapted to RCA for standard component connections. Instruction is selling their GameCube digital connector parts so that others may use them in their own custom GC video projects. I got a GameCube and I was kind of wanting to mod it. I was like kind of looking for a good HDMI solution and I just was not really happy with the current method. So I, I kind of set out and started redesigning my own board and then that's kind of where it went from there. Dan Coons is one of the current superstars of the retro modding and open source hardware design community. Known online as Citrus 3000 PSI, Dan has put considerable time into creating hardware based around GC video. His flagship design is the GC Dual, an internal mod that retains stock functionality of the digital output while adding HDMI output as well as component and RGB to the analog out, both being fully capable of 480p. A separate adapter can be used for connecting Wii component or SCART cables to tap into these higher quality analog signals. Digital and analog output work simultaneously, which we found very handy for playing on a CRT while capturing HDMI for a stream. GC Duel is now open source, so anybody can make one if they know how. Much more recently, Eon Gaming has announced a partnership with Dan Coons to produce what is essentially a plug-and-play version of the GC Duel with additional features. The GC HD Mark II features a similar design to its predecessor, with an easier but still secure fit. The second prong is not simply a dummy port. It now taps into the analog stereo signal for additional output options. The most obvious addition is a Wii-style AV port. This port supports Wii component cables and Wii RGB SCART cables, both of which can handle 480p video if your connected device can accept 480p over component or RGB. A new 3.5mm jack serves as a dual-purpose stereo output and mini toss link output for flexible analog or digital audio independent of the video output. Dan Coons has developed his own branch of the GC video firmware to account for the additional functionality and a few other features. Eon tells us that they're positioning the GCHD Mark II as the ultimate GameCube output solution that they'll never have to top. All features and all connections in one device, costing the same price as their original product. If the firmware is ever desired to be updated, the Mark II is much easier to open compared to its predecessor. We do have some concerns regarding the build quality, and the plastic in general feels much less robust compared to the first GCHD. Nonetheless, we've been happy with the device's performance, especially for analog video, which we'll go over in detail a bit later. Because the Mark II is expected to replace most of the demand for the GC Duel mod, Dan Coons is not planning to continue to offer kits or installation for GC Duel. But do-it-yourselfers can always create their own GC Duel by purchasing PCBs through Osh Park. We really love what all this means for the GameCube scene. While the GC HD Mark II covers virtually all possible needs for the GameCube power user in a single device, instruction separate HDMI and component solutions allow consumers to pick and choose. From our point of view, there's no wrong choice here. While the gist of GC video operation is the same as what we saw with early mods in our RGB207 episode, Let's spend a little time looking at some of the features and functionality common to all GC video products when using HDMI output. Specifically, we're looking at the system menu on the Carby here, which can be operated by an included infrared remote or trained to work with universal remotes. GC video is designed to be inherently free of input lag. While digital TVs and monitors will have varying degrees of lag that will impact your experience to some extent, GC Video provides the lowest possible baseline of latency from the HDMI output. Always research input lag when shopping for a new TV. Many are quite fast. RGB limited range should match the settings on your display. This is the scale that the display uses as a reference point for how all colors should look. Limited range is the preferred standard in the TV world while computer monitors are likely to favor full range. Neither is tangibly superior to the other and should look identical as long as your display or capture card settings match. 
If the black levels and the graphics look washed out, or dark levels are crushed to black, then either your GC video device or your display has a mismatch range setting. Note that GC Video technically operates in a modified DVI mode that can send audio and additional information over an HDMI output. Enhanced DVI mode must be selected in the menu to use digital audio. Most displays should accept this mode, but if not, you'll need to fall back on an external audio solution instead. For example, with the Carby, you can use standard GameCube AV cables for audio, which is what you have to do with the official component cables anyway. This is not possible with the first edition of GCHD, but with the Mark II, you can simply use audio from Wii cables or the built-in analog stereo and mini Toslink output. If for any reason you wish to tweak the picture, controls for brightness, contrast, and saturation are available. Unlike advanced video processors like the OSSC and FrameMeister, we're pretty much looking at 480p output, not 720p or 960p or 1080p or 1200p. But 480p tends to be handled reasonably well by modern TVs if the source video is high quality. 480p is, after all, the highest native resolution supported by the GameCube's games, so you just have to keep realistic expectations and remember that these games can never look like HD remasters or the Dolphin emulator when played on original hardware. Your preferences for line doubler and scan line settings are stored on a per resolution basis, all modes that the GameCube natively uses, 240p, 480i, 480p, and their PAL equivalents. For 480p, the line doubler is disabled, meaning you cannot double 480p to 960p as you can with the OSSC. Scan lines might be neat in 480p mode if you use the official Game Boy Player software, although you can do much better for Game Boy games, and we'll get to that in just a bit. When it comes to 480i, line doubling means that each alternating field of 240 lines is doubled, creating a flickering effect, often called Bob the Interlacing, that approximates the look of interlacing on a CRT television. If you hate the flicker, then turning on scan lines could make a 480i game look approximately like 240p, or you could go even further on the interlacing simulation with alternating scan lines. The look of Bob D interlacing isn't for everyone, but the reason for it is simple. It's fast. This implementation of Bob D interlacing allows GC video devices to maintain lag-free operation with interlaced input, but if you just can't tolerate it, you can turn off the line doubler for 480i. This will send a digital 480i signal to your TV instead, which will then perform its own motion adaptive deinterlace, the sort of deinterlacing you're probably more used to, but it can have visual errors and will be a bit laggier. 240p is not particularly common in GameCube games, but some compilations of older games do use it, and it can be forced through the use of homebrew software. Keeping the line doubler on to output these games as 480p probably looks better than your TV's own handling of 240p over HDMI, if your TV accepts that signal at all. The scan line option is pretty much made for 240p, since its purpose is to approximate the look of scan line separation that occurs with 240p on CRT displays. The popular FrameMeister upscaler has two HDMI inputs, which can be interesting when paired with GameCube HDMI output. While I've not had much luck getting 240p to work directly through HDMI this way, if you leave the line doubler on to send 480p to the FrameMeister, you might be able to do some interesting scaling with a little effort. Native 480p content is not likely to be improved much by the FrameMeister, but you could get some benefit by passing digital 480i through to the FrameMeister to let it handle the deinterlacing. I don't fully trust the FrameMeister's color handling with the HDMI inputs, but this is certainly worth experimenting with. A very minor chroma shift error that manifests with digital and RGB output was corrected with GC Video Firmware 2.4b. While it can be seen along test pattern edges, we found it to be virtually invisible when looking for it in an actual game scenario. With the Carby, you might have to crank your volume up just a bit higher than expected. A bug in the current base firmware is reducing digital audio levels, but a temporary fix is implemented in the custom Mark II branch. The change log can be viewed in the news file contained in the GC Video GitHub, but most of the recent tweaks have minimal tangible impact on features or picture quality, so we feel that the average user shouldn't worry too much about updating unless some truly transformative revisions are released. 
Homebrew software on Wii U is a popular alternative method for playing GameCube games via HDMI, although sadly you cannot use real game discs this way. This is archive footage from our GameCube RGB207 episode provided by Alex from Pause Break Reviews. However, the Wii U is not considered to scale 480p to 1080p all that well, so you might want to experiment with setting the system itself to 480p output. But keep in mind that we have not yet tested Wii U homebrew for ourselves, so our information is limited. If you're unsatisfied with how digital 480p looks when coming directly from GC Video HDMI output, then you might consider pairing one of the analog GC Video solutions with an all-purpose gaming video processor, such as the open source scan converter. The OSSC can do pretty much everything that GC Video HDMI can do and more. Most notably for 480p, the input can be doubled to 960p output if your TV can accept the signal. We really love this crisp look for 480p content, but others may prefer a softer scale. In addition, the OSSC can perform 4x output on 480i content and up to 5x on 240p. The FrameMeister is also excellent at handling 240p and does a superb motion adaptive deinterlace for 480i. The FrameMeister is considered less good at handling 480p, so in that case you're probably better off just sending HDMI directly to your TV from your GC video device rather than routing through a FrameMeister. Line doubler settings apply not only to HDMI but also analog output, so the line doubler must be disabled if you're connected to a 15 kHz device, such as a standard definition CRT. Of course, there's also the age-old question. Why not just play GameCube games with component cables on a Wii? This is certainly a decent and affordable way to get better picture quality from GameCube games, and it still pretty much counts as original hardware, although you're missing out on the Game Boy player. That said, Wii video output is generally considered to not be as good as GameCube. Certain later Wii hardware revisions do feature better video output than early models, but eventually GameCube support was removed from Wii consoles altogether, and even the better Wii systems are not quite as crisp as GameCube when held up under a magnifying glass. Since the OSSE's 480p 2x mode lets us do some real pixel peeping here, the most interesting thing we're seeing is that both the later Wii and the GCHD Mark II analog output appear to turn in cleaner image quality along certain contrasting color edges, although the later Wii is indeed still not as sharp as GameCube. Take a look at the differences in artifacts along the contour of Mario's hat, which is messiest with official component cables. Advanced users could probably hide this with per-system OSSC sampler settings, but as it stands here, the official GameCube cable fares less well. Honestly, it's pretty hard to see this from a normal viewing distance, and is probably mostly only relevant if you have a particular need to capture the best possible image from these consoles. And furthermore, these issues with official component could very well be masked depending on your connection method. When hooked up directly to my older 1080p HDTV, these 480p sources are sampled and upscaled in a fairly pleasing way. It's pretty much a wash here compared to what we saw with the OSSC. Likewise, if you're a CRT user, expect similar results among analog options. But what is surprising is that all available GC Video HDMI solutions appear to give us similar color edge artifacts to the official component cables. Not that the HDMI output is bad, we're way over analyzing here, but it does seem to mean that the newest analog methods earn a narrow overall win here, at least for OSSC users. And while we've mostly been looking at component, Corey will explain why in just a bit, the Mark II's 480p analog RGB output is also excellent and looks virtually indistinguishable from its component. Good news if your retro setup revolves around RGB. For the GCHD Mark II, you might be able to use Wii component or RGB cables that you already own, or you might have to buy an extra set. We didn't see any particularly tangible differences between official component, monster brand component, and a few other brands that we had on hand. We're also aware of HD Retrovision Wii component cables in the works, which contain no fancy circuitry, but are simply a new high quality option designed to their meticulous standards. The Mark II is plug and play with RGB cables built to the proper PAL Wii cable specifications with no attenuation required. 
which of course is a perfectly valid option for NTSC. The cable itself has nothing to do with PAL. It's just that normally NTSC region Wii and GameCube systems don't have RGB. In practice, minimal analog video noise appeared visible with any Wii cable we had on hand to try, component or RGB. At this early stage of development, we observed that the prototype insurrection cable is slightly clipping highlight details and crushing shadows. In fact, we ran into a very similar issue with an early production sample of the GCHD Mark II, which just goes to show that making this stuff isn't magic and that analog video takes extra work to get right. Insurrection tells us that they refuse to release their cables until they've dialed in the correct video levels, and we expect that they can achieve that goal since we've already seen this problem resolved with the GCHD Mark II. Eon's retail units that we've tested have the complete range of detail that GameCube games are expected to display. It's possible that there could still be errors in the open source code contributing to these challenges, and if so, we would like to see these fixes make their way back into the GC video project. We greatly appreciate both Eon and Insurrection for allowing us to examine and give feedback on these products before release. I mean, you know, we want this stuff to be good too. So thank you to all who have contributed to these devices and to GC video, because we've seen that it can be better than official component cables, something we frankly did not expect. So it's worth it to do it right. Of course, playing Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance games through the GameCube's Game Boy Player is a huge feature of the console for a lot of people. For the past several years, a homebrew project called Game Boy Interface has been considered to be a vastly superior option to running the Game Boy Player hardware compared to Nintendo's official boot disk software. A few options for using homebrew software with GameCube include using a special boot disk, such as an action replay, along with an SD card media launcher that goes in memory card slot B, or exploits using certain games that can allow for the loading of homebrew software that has been directly installed onto a GameCube memory card. Game Boy Interface comes in a variety of flavors, currently named by its creator Extremes, as standard, speedrunning, and high fidelity. Each is a balance of compatibility, latency, and resolution to suit the priorities of each user. While standard is the high compatibility mode, other versions may be unsuitable for HDMI output. We were able to get the speedrunning version, which is 240p, to work via the digital output of GC video devices to the FrameMeister's HDMI input, but only if the GC video line doubler was turned on for 480p output. However, due to the way GC Video normally works, these various modes may cause incompatibilities even with the analog output options in a way that would not affect the official component cables. To work around this, a feature developed by Chris2600 called Direct Mode or Direct Component has been implemented by Dan Kuntz in the GC Dual and GC HD Mark II firmware. Labeled in the menu as DYUV, this restores the picture output pipeline to its most basic state, allowing component to work with oddball video modes such as those used in some versions of the Game Boy interface. In particular, if you use the high fidelity version that's been tailored for the OSSC and have the OSSC's most recent firmware with optimized modes that are designed just for it, you'll get just about the danged crispest Game Boy pixels you could hope for. And for GBA games, they very nearly fill the screen with a 720p output from the OSSC. But since this is an optimized mode, you may have to bump your OSSC sampler settings a notch or two if you notice any flickering pixels. By now, you should have gotten a pretty good idea of what to expect from GC Video. Whether you choose one of these recent options or the official component cables, there's a few things you might want to know regarding GameCube video output before deciding to dive into an advanced solution. This is something you might prefer to go through life not knowing, so turn back now if you're afraid it might ruin GameCube games for you. So okay, are you in? Well, here's the thing. First, while the GC Dual and GC HD Mark II both support analog RGB output, be aware that GameCube and Wii Video is natively generated in a digital YCB CR color space rather than RGB, specifically in a compressed 422 format. Without getting too technical, the real world result is that blue and red appear to be rendered at a half horizontal resolution. While this is not necessarily obvious overall, it does mean that certain color edges may appear just a touch messy. 
For compatibility reasons, GC Video does include a process to convert 422 to uncompressed 444. However, since detail that does not exist cannot be restored, we're uncertain as to whether the conversion technique used has anything to do with the improved clarity along contours. Regardless, the fact that the video is natively 422 puts a bit of a ceiling on the overall image fidelity possible on GameCube hardware. However, a key takeaway from this is that in the case of the GameCube and Wii, RGB doesn't necessarily have an accuracy advantage over component, since YPBPR is simply an analog representation of YCBCR. Secondly, while 480p is a standard feature in Nintendo published titles, when it comes to third-party games, support is common, but certainly not guaranteed. When available, 480p is activated by holding B while booting a supported game. Sadly, no PAL region games support the format at all, with an optional 60Hz mode being offered on certain titles instead. However, through the use of a homebrew utility called Swiss, 480p output can in theory be forced for any title on any region of the console, although in some cases it may cause compatibility issues. And lastly, do know that a lot of GameCube games appear to run at a lower color depth that results in dithering. While many key titles like Metroid Prime and Smash don't seem to be affected, others like Wind Waker can be hit pretty hard. It's especially noticeable as the setting sun shifts the colors in the sky. In games like Prince of Persia or PNO3, heavy dithering is prominent in both interlaced and progressive modes. Interlace mode tends to reduce the intensity of the dither, but often some dithering can still be seen if you look really closely. So hey, we just thought you might like to know, since sometimes people ask us what's wrong when they upgrade cables and suddenly they can see patterns like these on their PS1 or other systems that tend to be prone to dithering. While dithering has never been a deal breaker for us, it might drive some people crazy. If dithering is one of your pet peeves, then you might consider just sticking with S-Video for NTSC systems or RGB for PAL systems, instead of spending so much money on component cables or an HDMI solution. But that's a choice only you can make. GameCube video output is finally in a good place. Between Insurrection Industries' pick-what-you-need approach and the all-the-features-you-could-ever-possibly-want GCHD Mark II, your bases are pretty well covered. Mods are no longer needed, and while we're curious to see if further developments may arise in the coming years, we're already to the point where the official GameCube component cables seem to no longer offer any unique benefits beyond being a collector's item. It's hard to find many negatives with the current situation, other than that, yes, even the less expensive solutions are still quite an investment for output from just one particular console. But if playing real GameCube hardware is important to you, we think you can't go wrong with any of the solutions that we've had a chance to look at.